Let's go to a little life out here. <laughs> It's a lot of fun. Keep it fun. Hey guys, welcome back to the UK and Irish Packers YouTube channel. It's Steve here at Steve the NFL. Give me a follow. So this history podcast that I'm about to bring you is all about the man called Tony Canadeo. He had a nickname. He was the Grey Ghost of Gonzago. Spooky. So Tony is really the only player that people don't know a whole lot about in the Packer players that have their jersey retired. So I'm here to rectify that. So now after listening to this podcast, I hope that you'll be able to be in a conversation with a fellow Packer fan and he'll start waxing lyrical and trying to prove you wrong. And you can say stuff like, well, you know what? That reminds me of the career of Tony Canadeo and start going on and explaining to the guy who hasn't the rashers who he is. So anyway, hopefully you enjoy this episode and make sure that you subscribe to the channel. And we also have podcasts on all types of Packers history, including uh, Paul Hornung, Ray Nitschke, Vince Lombardi. So make sure you hit the YouTube channel and scroll down through the videos and check them out. So for now, here is the man, the legend that is Tony Canadeo. So what I decided to do was, is I was looking at the retired numbers and a lot of these dudes we know about, but there's one guy that sort of stands out to me that I didn't really know anything about. So what I wanted to do was, is kind of research him myself anyway, and then bring what I find to you, okay? So I went sort of pawn around for sources and I had sort of a little bare bones thing. This was going to be like a you know a 10 minute podcast. Maybe it still will be, I don't know. Maybe I'll blaze through it because it's super late here. Um, so I fleshed it out a bit and, you know, got his career stats. There wasn't a whole lot about his upbringing. And then I found a brilliant article that went into how he was raised and stuff from encyclopedia.com. So I'm going to bring you that sort of piece as well. I thought the stuff was really interesting. Some stuff about this guy I don't understand uh, and I've grown to really like Tony Anthony Robert Canadeo uh, over all this time so the six jerseys retired by the Packers the first one was Don Hudson in 1951 Tony Canadeo followed in 1952 so the minute Tony Canadeo retired they retired his jersey which is interesting because even Don Hudson as ridiculously legendary as he was he retired in 1945 um from the Packers and they retired his jersey then six years later so Tony Canadeo kind of stood out to me for that regard because they retired it straight away which I found weird uh, so Bart Starr retired his in 1973 Ray Nitschke 1983 Reggie White 2007 and of course Brett Favre um, in 2015 so last year when we were over for the Dallas game we saw his name being put up onto the stadium because it doesn't get put up the minute they're retired, you know, it tends to take a bit of time to get it up there. So, like, Hudson, yeah, we know. Bart Starr, of course. Ray Nitschke, obviously. Reggie White, who doesn't. And Brett Favre, Jesus, uh, under a rock. So, Tony Canadeo was the only one to me that kind of stood out to, like, I don't really know that much about him. And every time he used to come up and I go, well, of course, but Tony Canadeo. But, I, you know, I didn't really know much about him. So, I said, screw it. I'm going to go in and look at it. So, let me get stuck in. This guy, I was so hoping he had an Irish background. I really was, because the more I read about him... And it, do you know what? The more I read about this guy, the more of kind of a walk and contradiction he was. Because an awful lot of people keep... All the sources that I'm reading anyway were saying that he was average. And he was just hardworking. I'm going to read out a quote later from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, from his page on there, where they say, you know, what he did and what he was. And his stats. And I'm going to try not bore you with stats. I'll mention them sort of as we go along. But look, what I'm trying to do is... And I've done a dumper load of errors since I got home from work. I've done hours and hours on this thing. Trying to put some sort of cohesive thing. Because everything will give you stats. And they give you a sort of, you know, a tagline or two. And I tried to get a real feeling of exactly who this dude was. And the era that he was playing in. So yeah, I'll give you some stats. But I'm not going to get too deep into it, right? So, and I'm not going to... This isn't off Wikipedia either. I stay completely away from Wikipedia when I'm doing stuff. Uh, but it's going to sound like a Wikipedia article because they do their stuff in chronological order. So I'm kind of going to bounce around a bit because, let's face it, I'm a scatological Irishman, right? It's a scatty brain, leprechaun, hyperactive. So I'm going to try put a cohesive thing together. So born the 5th of May, 1919, in Chicago, of all places. And that kind of gets interesting from where he bounces around. So his dad was also called Anthony Canadeo. He was Anthony Robert Canadeo, and he has he ended up having a son later in life called Robert as well. That's where I got it from. And I knew that his name obviously was Canadeo. He was going to be Italian-American, but then I was thinking, oh, I hope the mammy is like, you know, 
Bridget Bernadette O'Brien from Ireland. She wasn't. She was, her name was Catherine Marinello. And again, hoping he was Irish, but totally not. So he grew up on the intersection of uh, Grand and Western Avenues in Chicago, which I don't know if there's any Italian Americans listening, if there's any uh, Chi Town Americans listening, if that's a super still Italian place, don't know. But apparently that was the quintessential Italian American place. His dad was a mechanic on streetcars in the, for the Chicago Surface Line, according to Encyclopedia.com, and there were a normal family, normal Italian American family. Uh, there were a one income household. His mom was a stay at home mom. So she stayed at home, looked after him and his three brothers, and he had one sister as well. So they were saving and decided to move when he was six years of age, headed off to Western Chicago. So like any other kid back in the day, he used to play street ball. Now, an awful lot of what I see, his narrative coming up online of who he was influenced by, it was his brother called Savior, and they call him Savvy. Savvy convinced him to enroll in football in high school and said, you know, give it a give it a bash. So it, this is where kind of you'll see with Tony Canadeo, his stats are kind of crazy, right? So he was kind of a jack of all trades throughout his entire career. So high school, college, and the pros, they kind of got him to do everything. Now this again, like myself and Ryan were talking about on the History Podcast, like you're on offense, you're on defense, you're expected to do a bunch of things. Um, and especially in Green Bay, for some reason, they had a history of getting a player in as one thing and then converting them into something different. And nowadays in the NFL, you'll find that players will come in at one thing and then transition. So, you know, Charles Woodson did it famously. So they were kind of doing it back then as well. So you'll see that Tony, Tony Canadeo, geez, it's late. Tony Canadeo comes in as one thing and sort of transitions throughout his career. And I'm going to try to give you sort of a feeling of that, but I'll get past the him growing up stuff into his career now. So he got him to enroll in this small high school called Steinmetz High School. So they were tiny, um, but they're really punching above their weight in high school. And he sort of helped towards that. So... The narrative that I see with Tony Canadeo is is that on one side of an article, it'll say he did really well. He was great. He was their standout player. He was a star. And he was in the all-time team of X thing. And then they'll say, but he wasn't great. And he was kind of so-so. You know, wasn't fast. Wasn't elusive. He was okay. He wasn't highly touted. And then on the other side, it'll say, but he was up there with the Heisman winner. You know, so it's weird. So I'm going to try convey what I can through his stats as opposed to listening to the sources because they kind of trip over themselves like one sentence after the other but anyway so he's pretty handy in high school bit of a jack of all trades um, he used to throw the ball around and they made it to the playoffs in the Catholic League Championships I know who doesn't know that right the Catholic League Championships obviously a massive league at the time Jesus so they got into the playoffs but they ended up getting clobbered but the next game that they would have went on to in the playoffs they would have ended up playing in Soldier Field now bear in mind this guy's from Chicago so he's playing in the Catholic League Championships in Chi-Town and that would be you know the biggest thing you can go to Soldier Field now he's going to be going and waxing the Bears when he started playing for the Packers so he wasn't ready just yet obviously to get into Soldier Field at the time so again Savvy comes back into it so Savvy which is Tony's brother gets him a job in Green Bay so you'll find that most of Tony's career now so he's born in Chicago gets a job in Green Bay his brother has a large influence in Wisconsin as well so his brother at the time was a pretty good welterweight boxer in St. Norbert's College which you'll recognize the name in the Pierre Wisconsin and he got a, Tony a job in Green Bay. And Tony was kind of faffing around, didn't know what he wanted to do. Now, if the name St. Norbert's College piques your interest, it's because the Packers have, they practice in St. Norbert's. And according to the St. Norbert's or the education website, the Packers have the longest standing contractual continual use of that place as kind of like a, a little training camp. So in 2016, it was their 59th consecutive year using it which is the longest run for an nfl team but if you're going to get excited and go oh well that's back in tony's time it wasn't because they only started that in 1958 uh, he retired in 1952 but a nice little sort of tidbit to know that his brother was boxing away as a welterweight in st norbert's in the pierre and you know when his brother was to retire from the nfl a couple of years later that's when the packers go in and they get that as their their practice place and go on but anyway i digress so he got him the job in green bay savvy did he was kind of always from what it seems like looking after him and convincing him to do stuff right and that's where when he was in green bay tony met a guy called tiny cahoon now if you 
if you know the history podcast somebody's names come up and tony coon was an ex-packer and he was also a high school coach and his best mate was a head coach in gonzago university and so he said to tony like why don't you go up and play for gonzago it's a small school there's only a thousand people go up there and play from a buddy who's the head coach and he'll help you out so according to encyclopedia.com they have a quite a nice quote there from tony canadeo and he says that him and five mates uh they went now uh, Gonzago University is in Washington so it's ages away so they went and bought themselves a 1927 Packard touring car and he got five dudes they bundled into this car and it said it took them a week and six flat tires to get there so he went up to Gonzago and that's where he had his college career um, so in Gonzago University he was known as the grey ghost of Gonzago because even when he was in college his hair started to go a bit grey so a bit, a bit of a silver fox as they call him Um, Now, again, like all the articles I'm reading, they're saying he wasn't highly touted in college. But then I read through some of his stats and see all the teams and all teams that he was voted on to. And I'm thinking, Jesus, this guy seems fairly handy. Like, I've no idea why he wasn't highly touted coming out of college. Um, I'll get to his college stats, just run through some uh, quick stuff, sort of notable stuff. And he was only drafted ninth round to Green Bay, which was 77th overall, which seems quite low for the ninth round, in 1941. Um... And again, like the, the ninth round, and I'm going to read his college stuff now and you'll see. Now, one article said that he was called the Grey Ghost, obviously because his hair was going grey, but also his spooky running style. I don't know what that means. I've never heard, I've never switched on a paranormal activity program and seen a ghost doing jukes and, you know, going over for touchdowns. Like, that's never happened. I've seen them go boo and, like, touch people, but I've never seen them, I've never seen a ghost juke you in a basement of some place. But anyway... Um, don't know what it means so he goes to college he plays quarterback he plays running back he plays kick returner punt returner Um, so he was super handy and one of the highlights of his freshman year was that he returned the kickoff for 90 yards for a touchdown which is fairly handy and goes to show that there were you know they were still kicking fairly long back then to kick to the 10 yard line he returns it Um, other college highlights was he returned a kickoff then for 102 yards 105 yards I think in his second or third year he was voted to the All Pacific Coast Conference team. I know, big deal, right? Uh, he bet Oregon when he was playing for this tiny thousand person college. And they then went to the Rose Bowl after, but he bet them 12 7. He played quarterback and he was throwing all over them. He had pretty good stats. I'm not going to go into them because who cares? Um, in 1940, he was named to the Associated Press Little All America first team. Don't know if that's a thing. Uh, then was voted to the All Pacific Coast team. Uh, on the, I think it's his final year and he stacked up pretty well apparently uh, with Tom Harmon who won the Heisman Trophy the year before he went and got drafted by Green Bay so this is the contradiction I'm talking about right in the same article it says he wasn't highly touted he was a bit gack and then it says but he stacked up pretty well stat wise to the guy who won the Heisman Trophy so it's a contradiction in terms he's seen as a bit of a legend you look at his numbers sometimes they aren't great and then all of a sudden he's up there as one of the best ever so anyway gets drafted ninth round goes to green bay 77th overall and one thing that i noticed um and i read it in the articles as well it says that he was undersized as a pro so depending on you know what you read he was either five foot ten or five foot eleven i think the official stats is five foot eleven and he was 190 pounds is what they say now i think he was 190 pounds later in his career he kind of filled out after he went so his career was broken down like this right so he started off and played Uh, well he played 11 years for the Packers but he played 1941 to 1944 and those teams were absolute dynamite then he went off to the war and then when he came back he played from 1946 to 1952 so from 1941 to 1944 I think he played about 170 pounds don't know what it is in stone what's a stone 14 pounds so he's about whatever I'm not going to get into it because I'm supposed to be an accountant so I'm not going to do off the cuff maths uh, because this recorded forever so he started off light and undersized and he did seem undersized right because i was in the pro football hall of fame the packers pro football hall of fame falling over myself again in green bay and we go over for week one uh to watch the seahawks game we've got another tour of that and apparently they're doing guided tours but when i went over i was just roaming around and i was looking at one of his jerseys and it looked really small now i don't know whether because there were kind of cotton jerseys you know there was kind of it was like wearing a jumper at that stage and the padding wasn't as big so the jerseys tended to be quite small but looking at it it looked like it would fit me and i'm not gonna crank out my height uh but i'm not 5'11 i wish um so 
it seemed small and it seemed like it fit me so even I was looking at it going Jesus you know this guy's in got his retired jersey retired and he seems quite short to me but and then I was thinking, well, back in the day, and I think it's on the Packers Live documentary, I say his jersey looks quite small, but I suppose back in the day they were all a bit smaller. So 5'11", 190 pounds later in his career. Again, he was used kind of as a jack of all trades for Green Bay. He played offense as a quarterback, wide receiver, running back, and a punt and kickoff returner. And then he played on defense as a cornerback. So, as I said, played 11 years, 1941 to 1944. They were great. 1944, he was the uh, NFL champion. Of course, this was before it was called a Super Bowl. Then he played 1946 to 1952 and went into the army uh, during World War II. And during World War II, I found out, because I was trying to look, he was an anti-aircraft soldier. So he was in the anti-aircraft unit, right? Apologies to all the military men out there, but I come from a military family, but it's the Irish military, so I don't believe we have any anti-aircraft units. Maybe they do. I don't know. I'm not going to get into it. Anyway, so his stats. So... He had 8,667 multi-purpose yards. So as the Pro Football Hall of Fame puts it, he accounted for almost 75 yards in every game and he played 116 games. So from what I gleaned from all of the websites and I'm not reading off anybody else's website, I'm trying to add the stuff. And I found a, a numerical error on Packers.com. So I was delighted with myself because it was adding and I was like, that doesn't make sense. But then I saw that it was a bit of a typo, right? So... The most games that they played back then in a season was 12. So it's not like the 16 games now. So when I say some of his stats, bear in mind, he's four less games, four fewer games. It's probably better. Uh, so he had 12 games a season instead of 16. So from 1941 to 1944, Green Bay were dominant. So from 1946 to 1952, Tony Canadeo shone on all those teams, but the teams sucked. So let me just bring up, uh, you know, the years and how they did. So 1941, uh, they were 10-1. and one. Again, so one game is obviously missing there. Uh, 1942, they were 8-2-1. 1943, 7-2-1. 1944, 8-2-0. And, oh. and then from 1945 downwards, because I think the teams were decimated with people going off to the war and all the rest throughout these sort of intermittent years. Obviously from 1939 to 1945, but players were coming in and out. So from 1944 onwards, they were useless. So they won 8 games in 44, 6 games in 45, 6 games in 46 six games in 47 then it dips to three games two games three games three games and again he retires we're a six and six team so they kind of declined but again he was known to shine on those teams so after he came back from the war he was predominantly a running back now what i love about this is is that in 1943 He's the number one passer. I'm kind of going to fall over myself here because I've got all this stuff kind of written down hiddly piddly. But he came back um, in, this is what I like, and I'll sort of jump back in time. 1944, he only plays three games, right? And he's actually in the army at that stage, but he gets dishonorably discharged because he has to come home for the birth of his son. So what does he do? Like a typical man, can't stay at home, has to piss off and do something else. So goes up to Green Bay, signs a contract, and I've read through some sort of news article clips about like, they go, oh, the veteran running back is back. So he comes over to Green Bay and the first thing he does, now he would have played under Curly Lambeau uh, as the head coach all the way up to 1949. And then it switches to the Gene Rosani era from 1950 to 52. And that's when they did pretty crap. Now the last couple of years, so uh, 48, 49, they were doing terrible under Curly Lambeau. They only won three games of 48, two games of 49. And I'm repeating myself, uh, but it's not easy to listen to when someone just starts throwing winning games at you. So 1944 comes back under um, Curly Lambeau and he plays three games because he's only back uh, because they've, he's been dishonorably discharged. And then, so, he, you know, three games isn't a whole lot as a thing. But anyway, the year before that, 1943, he becomes the number one passer. So he was an understudy when he signed and they kind of were trying to use him as kind of a quarterback and then he was a running back and then he was kick return and punt return. And I'm going to try to get into some of the stats about it. And CeCe Lispel was the quarterback at that time, a bit of a legend. Uh, but he went and retired prematurely. And they asked Cecil Lispel at the time, like, what, you know, why did you leave early? You know, and he said, what he did was, he quit to become the coach for the Purdue Boilermakers at the time. And it was a bit of a shock move. And they said, you know, you're still in your prime. You're still doing really well. Why did you leave? And he said, he, you know, he in, La in Green Bay, he saw Curly Lambeau going around the locker room and telling dudes like Arnie Herber that they were no longer needed. And he always swore that that had never happened to him. And he was going to quit before that happened to him. So... 
uh, Cecil Lisbell left and then Canadeo took over quarterback duties and was the number one passer in Green Bay for the Packers in 1943. He was named to the NFL All-Pro team that year in 1943 and he was voted again in 1949 and I'll get on to why in 1949 because it was pretty spectacular um so is there anything else I need to say to you yeah so he was used as a quarterback behind CC Lisbell so 1951 it was his sort of heavy receiving year he, and again I say heavy he was used for 22 receptions for 226 yards average 10.3 yards per catch uh he didn't have any passes then really after 1948 he had uh, one pass in 1952, but it didn't go anywhere. It fell short, so it was uncompleted. Had a quarterback rating of zero in that year. So 1944, as I said, dishonorably discharged for the birth of the son. Decides to piss off and throw, you know, do some running back, do some passes. So in 1949, which was the other year that he became an all team, an all NFL team uh, selection. He rushed for over a thousand yards. So he was only the third player in NFL history at that stage to do it. Now, all these websites and all the articles that had who it was that he was the third player, they all just sort of repeat themselves. They didn't actually go into who the first two was, so I had to go fishing for it. So he averaged 5.1 yards per attempt and he got only four touchdowns, which is weird because he got over a thousand yards. And again, that's when he was named to the all NFL team. So he was the third player in NFL history at that stage to do it. So it was a pretty big feat. So up to that point, the number one person to do it was a guy called B.D. Feathers, who actually played for the Bears and went and played for the Packers at one stage. And he did it in 1934. So he did it 15 years earlier. So it'll go to show you how difficult it was to do at that stage, because remember, it was only a 12-game season. So B.D. Feathers did it, and he did it in his rookie season as well, which is mental. And he did it for the Bears, so he probably notched up a dumper load of those yards on the Packers. His season average, B.D. Feathers was 8.44 yards per carry which is still an NFL record to this day it's, it's crazy stats the second person to do it was Steve Van Buren and he played for the Eagles and the Eagles were pretty dominant at the time so he ran for 1,008 yards uh, back in I don't know when it was I didn't even write it down I think it was uh, it was early 1940s anyway so he ran for 1,008 yards and then he ran for 1,049, I think, or 1,200 and something, something mental anyway, in 1949, which is the same year that Tony Canadeo did it. Now, to, to put into perspective of what Steve Van Buren was like, is the Eagles have also retired his jersey number. He's still the Eagles franchise leader in rushing and he's the only player at that stage um, to run for multiple thousand yard seasons and he also rushed for more than 10 touchdowns in one season and he did that three times so this guy was pretty ridiculous but anyway away from all those dudes back to tony canadeo so tony canadeo in his in his time with the packers returned punts and kickoffs pretty much in his entire career so it's kind of looking at you know when he did what there was some years where they didn't get him to return any kickoffs and he but in that year he returned punts and then vice versa so when he wasn't returning punts he was returning kickoffs but throughout his entire career no matter how old he got they put him on that duty so a quick rush down through his stats so an offense for rushing 4197 yards on 1025 attempts that was 4.1 yards per attempt in his career scored 26 rushing touchdowns they also used him as a receiver, so 579 yards, uh, 69 receptions, an average of 8.3 yards per reception, 5 touchdowns. Uh, passing, 1,642 yards, and passing though, he's not going to win any awards for this, he definitely didn't make, uh, this is why I mentioned him in passing when me and Ryan were doing our all Packers team and we're on quarterbacks, because I just found it interesting that he's known for being a running back, but also passed, but wait till you get a load of this. Uh, 16 touchdowns that's okay 20 interceptions not great when your interceptions outweigh your touchdowns he's no Aaron Rodgers his completion percentage 39.2% not great quarterback rating of 49.1 again not great uh, 6.13 yards per attempt yeah not going to be uh, winning any awards so on punting then 45 punts uh, in 1941 to 1948 doesn't punt after that 1669 yards so a 37.1 yard per punt which i think in today i think actually when you look at the the packers punters now 
they're up around the late 30s early 40s in punting and all this directional punting stuff so he wasn't doing too bad special teams then uh, punt returns he returned 46 for 513 yards that's 11.2 yards average for a punt return it's okay uh, kickoff returns 75 of them for 1736 yards which is a 23.1 yards average and then he played on defense he was a cornerback and he got nine interceptions which is pretty handy so he played defense up to 1948 played till 1952 and they, they obviously didn't need him thereafter because he didn't do any of that after it so all in all this guy was a bit of a legend bit of a jack of all trades uh the pro football hall of fame if i can find the quote here uh says that i can't find it now but they were saying that you know he was um an all-round kind of guy you know he wasn't known for his speed wasn't known for his elusiveness but was sort of dependable and consistent so after he retired he stayed around green bay and he was kind of known as a gentleman about uh, everyone loved him he did a lot for the community um he broadcast packers games for uh, w bay or wbay tv not sure how you're supposed to say it so according then to encyclopedia.com and a great article by jim campbell he says that um, in 1972 he needed a kidney transplant and his son Robert went and gave him and donated that kidney and Robert himself was actually a Vietnam vet so here was his dad going away uh, anti-aircraft unit in World War II and then his son Robert was a decorated Vietnam vet and of course steps up to the plate for his dad and gives him a kidney in 1972 so unfortunately and it was quite late actually when you look at all the stuff that he was doing way back when and the fact that he was playing for the Packers in the 40s and he only died in 2003 at the age of 84 in St. Mary's Hospital in Green Bay he's buried in Allo's Catholic Cemetery in Green Bay and I think he just fell into consciousness and passed away so in 2003 the Packers on the back of their helmets like you see an awful lot around the league they had a little black football and a number three in it and that was to commemorate this guy so as i said like his his number was retired straight away in 1952 it was the second jersey to be retired and don hudson's was the first in 1951 so that's tony canadeo in a nutshell so again first half of his career uh, he was a bit lighter uh, on a massive d- dominating team 1944 they won the championship against the new york giants green bay won 14 to 7 he goes away to the army uh, he comes back like a cheeky hooer and plays three games while he's is on leave for his son's birth then goes back and plays for the packers but the team are pretty crap and they disintegrate then by the time he leaves he's up there with some of the dudes in the fact of with his rushing yards breaks a thousand yards which was incredible um and then retires uh, jersey retired straight away and he's sort of stays about green bay and passes away then so all in all jack of all trades seems like a great guy obviously made a massive impact on the packers but it's weird that he made such an impact back then he was known for such a long time and nowadays if you ask anybody they know the bart stars they know the don hudson's you know obviously they know reggie whites and and brett Favre, but they don't you know not a lot said about tony canadeo and when you i know we put it up on our instagram account which is at uk packers on instagram and we put up you know if you're a true diehard do you know these players and a lot of them struggled on tony canadeo and uh, now it's easy if you know his number but anyway so supplemental reading so um i if you want to go pop along and look at packers.com they don't go into the detail that i did uh, encyclopedia.com is a great article by jim campbell there's a lot of detail in that an awful lot of the stuff on his background that i got for this uh, podcast uh, that's great and in that article it gives you a supplemental reading as well so there's a bi- uh, biography on tony canadeo called in search of a hero the life and times of tony canadeo and that's by david zimmerman uh it says that his life and career discussed in chuck johnson the greatest packers of them all and that's from 1968 and donalore smith's nfl pro football hall of fame all-time greats which was published in 1988 so folks there it is that's the life and times of tony canadeo i hope you enjoyed it and if you did make sure that you subscribe to the youtube channel maybe give us a like maybe leave a comment in the comment section and of course you can follow us on social media in the handles above but i'll be back to you in the next couple of days make sure you stay tuned to the youtube channel and until then guys See you then.